god! Oh! Oh god, mate, everything. I'm 32, everything's breaking down, I'm just gonna dissolve into a pile of flesh and bone by the end of today. So, uh, yeah, fun times. And speaking of breaking people down to their screaming-based constituents, uh, let's play some more The Executioner. Um, just to kind of, oh, well, I'll load it and we'll start getting into it. Basically, uh, the devs have been hot on this, uh, making sure that all the little issues I was encountering previously are no longer, you know, there. Um, and I know, I know the game's kind of been getting a bit of stick on Steam, and I know the reviews are kind of mixed at the moment, but credit to them, they're a small studio, and they have really taken some big steps to try and make this look a lot better. So hopefully, although I'm looking, and I'm seeing that this hasn't actually uh, gone over to the game screen yet. Mild concern. Is that what I need to press? I've forgotten what my hotkeys are. I might be just being dumb. Let's find out. Just st Ah, yeah, there we go. Yay! Success. Right, so. Uh, we are actually not going to be right back to where we were originally because I've taken some time to figure out precisely how the fuck shit works. Uh, and I'm going to go back through doing the uh, poacher uh, interrogation again. Because to begin with, and I will, I will freely give the game a little bit of stick for this, it didn't make some of the mechanics massively clear even after, tu after the tutorial. I don't know if that was just me being really fucking dumb, but some of it didn't click. And after sitting down and going through it a couple of times, I was able to actually kind of figure out how stuff worked. I feel like if the tutorial had just let me experiment, I would be able to get a better grip on how stuff works and how the balance of things work. Whereas the very structured, re the st kind of very structured route it took worked, it just wasn't necessarily conducive to me learning. It just taught me very basic steps about very limited moves. For example, well, let's just load. So I want the very first part of day three. Uh, also the quick saving and uh, there's a bunch of quality of life improvements they've just done. Like some of the translations are now much better. The bug reporting form is now in English rather than Russian. There are still some things I saw as I was quickly skipping through to day three. I saw a few pages load in Russian, so... Ugh. But uh, yes! Let us crack on. <laughs> I keep forgetting how surly the sun looks on this. Like, the fuck do you want? Very Russian. Right, so, stand up before dawn, almost with happiness, exhausted with the night visions and cruel nightmares which waited under my eyelids. Right, so, we went with this previously. The law is a lie. We just kick the shit out of people and get paid for it. And the gamekeeper. Okay, so, uh, immediately this... I don't know if they've done any tweaks here, but it looks slightly nicer, I think? I might have just been imagining this. But um, essentially what I missed last time is that if this, if there is this icon, that will use my companion. And each tag for here is 10 points of my stamina. Now, the thing is, you've got to manage your assistant. Especially this guy at the moment. Use him too much and he will become unavailable for the rest of the interrogation. So... You've got to be a bit more... It, you've got to think a little bit more about what you're specifically doing. Now, for this guy, atrocities just don't seem to work as far as I'm aware. And apparently those ones actually cost me sanity to perform. So we'll, we'll try and avoid uh, fucking myself up too much. Naturally, some of these things will cause me a lot more to, a lot more pain and suffering than others and if you push people too far they will definitely go over the deep end too quickly what i forgot is that denying rest of the victim has a mild abrasive effect against both their health and their sanity so using this to rest still requires you to be conscious of precisely how vulnerable they are now we have these three questions i have yet to be able to get him to answer all three but the big one is to sign the confession and these two I mean, honestly, the daughter is not the most pertinent part of this. The accomplices and the main confession are the two things I want. Now, if he is too high up on either one of these tracks, uh, the, if I ask a question, it simply won't work. In fact, something else I also didn't realise is, if I ask a question, I'm basically giving him a free round to recuperate. Cross-interrogating and threatening keep them on the reserve and limit how much they can regenerate, but still degrade one of the tracks. So you've got to be a bit mindful, and again, it does use both your energy and having your assistant with you at the same time. So, pacing precisely when you ask questions is also kind of important, which, again, adds extra layers to this. So, um, yeah, I guess we start off by um, giving him the old pokey, 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 and the, and the uh, oh god. Right, so yes. For the moment, we're just going to stick some... Mm, needles under there. You're fine, mate, you're fine. Um, let's just pat him down with 
bit of drowning. This will stop his um, sanity recuperating as much as well. There we go. Right, so now his health is a fairly decent way down. Uh, sanity is a fairly decent way down. We drop a dose of the old battery. Well, this is the thing now. Do I want to go for battery or do I want to deny him rest? I actually think denying him rest now is actually a better idea. So I'll let the assistant do that. Right, so I'm not entirely certain they haven't they don't give a great explanation as to how long you um how many times you have him for. But uh, right, so what I want to do now is battery to soak him up a little bit. Yeah, 15 stamina. Skull is crushed, Jesus Christ. Your muscles buzz unpleasantly, then finger bones hurt. You have been working without your new gloves, not wanting to stain them with blood. Your victim is doing much worse, however. He is wheezing and quietly groaning, huddled up in the torture chair. Yeah, that, that sounds pretty bad. That sounds pretty bad. Right. Now, we give him a bit of the old uh, water torture. Right, this should be enough. Now, when they're at this point, you want to pressure the one gauge they've got more of. So, hitting him in his... Emotions is probably better, so let's go for the confession first. I'll cut you into pieces. There we go. So, because it was low enough, the victim's physical condition has worsened. Now, I think the next time I use him, I'll actually lose the companion, so I've got to be a bit cagey about this. S Finally, you hear what you've been aiming for. All the hope is gone from the gamekeeper's voice, and only despair remains. His voice is being interrupted by dry sobbing. I... I will sign everything, please. I'm guilty. Just leave me alone. There we go. That is number one. Sorted. Now, we need to wear him down a little bit more. Now, unfortunately, we don't really have an opportunity to let the companion help uh, keep him tidied over. So I'm just going to have to take a rest and he's going to have to uh, re recoup a little bit as well. Now, let's see. If I deny rest... Let's see. I've only got 30 stamina, so I don't want to waste too much of this. That will cost me 25. I think that's one problem I have, actually, is that this is not an accurate guide as to how much stamina everything seems to use. Because you think, if one is 15, two would be 30. But two is actually 25, so it's a base of five, then one for every single tag. Which, mentally, that just doesn't quite gel with me. You have rest. The eager assistant waits you outside the torture chamber, irritated, eager to continue. Stop being so fucking excited by this, you filthy bastard. Right. Now, yeah, generally, at atrocities, I don't see the point. It, by the time you get them low enough to answer a question, you've either broken them or they're about to recuperate and um, basically go for another round. So, so, I've got a feeling if I hit him too hard, he's actually going to take aggravated damage now that he's got his crushed skull. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking some of this stuff might actually be... In fact, let me have a look at the log. None of that stuff, because I realised all the purple text is actually stuff I can determine the uh, answers from, but... Let's see. You have rest, blah blah blah. Uh, I suppose... No, I can't do that with myself, can I? I am going to need to... I suppose the drowning again. 25. Well, he's not having a good time. Let's take a stab at that. Answer me. Uh, the gamekeeper has really lost his voice from all the screaming, but continues to stubbornly shake his head when you ask your question. Sprays of blood and saliva leaking spots on your pants and apron. Who is he protecting? How many different tortures is he ready to endure for his accomplices? But the right question is, which torture will he not be able to handle? So yeah, his physical condition is too good, so everything's gone back up again. And unfortunately, the companions just stopped being fucking available. I'm honestly not sure if... I could have sworn I only used him once. I feel like the game is possibly having issues here. Because, yeah, I'll need to take, yeah, probably two rests. Yeah, those are diminishing returns as well, so I'm going to want to... Yeah, that's only going to do minor degradation, so what I want is to wear him down as much as I can. 25. Okay, so that cost me 25 to bring him down. I don't know how much these cost. In fact, I don't think I can even use them anymore because I've lost the assistant. 
I, t I could have sworn I only used the fucker like twice, but okay. The most useless piece of shit that God has ever shoveled guts into, but okay. Yeah, that's only 15, so what I want to do... I mean, or I could go for the big moves. I could go big money here, but that is going to give me sanity loss. Ah, uh, yeah, so like 40 damage. I mean, he can probably take it, let's be honest here. So like 25. Sorry, mate. Oh, by the way, enjoy the sound effect. Oh, that is... Mm, that's, that's, that's flavor country right there. Fuck me sideways. Right. So yeah, answer, asking quite right. So if we deny rest of the victim again... Hmm... Let's see. That's 15. And that's 25. Right. And I've only got 30. So I could do one batch of needles under the nails, one batch of battery, and still ask him a question. So we're going to go with that. Oh, he's not having a good day, is he? Right. Mmm. Now, I guess we're going to try and go for the battery and hopefully not kill him. Oh, there we go. Right. He is uh, having a distinctly bad day, but that should wear him down. Answer me. There we go. I do this alone, I swear. I know this forest and the drills dukes can't, and the drills that the dukes hunters rarely use. For winter, my brother joins me. He lives in the north. There is a famine in their village when it's cold. I hunt only for my family and have never let the poachers to hunt. I was so careful. My only aid was my brother, but this time we have nothing to do with it. I saw him last week in the tavern by the south gates. He said that he could not visit us because his landlord sent him to the capital with an errand. He hasn't even been in the forest. That's fair enough. And, uh, I mean, we've got three rounds, but frankly, there is nothing else. I mean, the gamekeeper's door has nothing like that, but... My own curiosity is not worth brutalizing this poor fucker any more than we already have. I mean, I suppose since we can since we can ask. Answer me. Oh shit! There we go. We actually got all three. Fucking hell! The gamekeeper is blindly staring behind your back and mon um, monotonically shakes in the torturing chair. Daughter, she was near the house when Duke's men broke in. If she wasn't there, then she most likely ran away and hid. But she has nowhere to go. Maybe to her aunt. But she lives in Leech End. It's so far. Shit. Okay, I actually managed to do all three. Uh, I'll have a little have a little nap then, I guess. You can also have a nice little uh, chill, my dude. Boom! In the hallways of the royal prison, night is similar to morning, with uh, with the only difference being newly placed torches and the change change in the sound of guards' footsteps. New shifts of the guards have arrived. Guards at the gate spins the wheel, lifting the gate. Strong wind pushes you in the chest. It has always been windy here. <laughs> Fucking farty. Your head hurts from exhaustion. You have done everything you could. In your head, you hear a familiar phrase of your father. Have you? I have! I <laughs> fucking aced it! And I only cut off one of his limbs. <laughs> I feel fucking horrible about that, but... You know what? At some point, you've got to just... Oh shit, that's a... That was a big hit to the stats, to the old brain box. Fuck me. Right. Walk up to the office of the royal judge. Blah, 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 blah. Suck my dick. You are going to keep the appearance of decency, but you can't be fucked. The man's a complete shit heel. So I, I said this last time, and I, I got some information out of him, so I might as well do it for a second time. Ba 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 ba. His words are true, but semi transparent, like an empty snail shell. He shrugs, shrugs you off with roundabout phrases that do not mean much without telling the whole truth. There we go. So his words flicker in the air, but do not dissolve completely, leaving a sticky trace. It is a lie. A slug like lie. Fucking filth. Right. Uh, just let him chat. And that's my file. Just see if this changes. When his left hand reaches for the sheet of parchment containing the gamekeeper's confession, duly authorised by your seal, you shudder as if with a spasm of pain. So wrong and unnatural is his movement. The judge's hand really looks weird, covered in a silk black glove, but it appears very angular and rigid. It might be an old trauma, but the judge is at ease of his used to long, as, as if long used to this feature of his. The gamekeepers. Oh, sorry. <coughs> sorry, we're going for prick. So we're going for prick voice, aren't we? The gamekeeper. Oh, mm, the gamekeeper's signature has been obtained. He says, and this young man is exactly why your profession is so highly valued. The king is merciful towards us, his servants, so lo as long as we uphold the order in our kingdom. This order is heavily dependent on how happy the general populace is. It is easy to anger the crowd, 
but it is much harder to calm their anger. You are the one who rules their mood, feeding the beast, as they say. A great responsibility rests with you. You remember that your father told you this before, using almost the same words. Be the beast! It's a documentary that Eric Banner did about muscle cars. You may prefer to finish fic quickly, or blah 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 blah. You're just sitting there as the guy goes like, and peace. Suck my dick. Dick 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 dick. Nice. And we go over to the Palace Square. The sun is burning in zenith when you arrive on Palace Square in a new apron with the embroidered crown on the chest. Oh, aren't they so pretty? <laughs> it's got fucking Hang the Cook embroidered on it. Uh, the onlooker's gazes rip into you as a thousand little fish hooks, but your darkest fears have happened right here already, and now you feel nothing under this intense attention. The gleam boards of the scaffolds slightly stick to the soles of your boots. You can't get rid of the thought that this very place yesterday your father lost his head on this ridiculous, strange accusation. Behind your back, the assistant is fussing about the rope in anticipation. Previously, it was you who stood behind the father during executions, observing his meagre actions, ready to do all he could say. For the first time in your life, you have to carry out the execution yourself. It causes nausea. There is a strange feeling inside that you can hardly name. Most of all, it looks like... Now, what did we go for previously? I think it was concentration? Disgust feels more... honest. Honestly, because this is just like... Uh, well, okay, because I've got to kill a guy who really doesn't feel like he was, uh... God. Pfft. Uh, let's have a look here. So, that's better than getting you. Ba 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 Right. For some reason that's not being concluded yet, but okay, we'll go with disgust. It shouldn't be like this. People should not take life from other people just because someone orders that. You are going to hang a man who has nothing, done nothing to you. Remember the gamekeeper's face distorted by pain and shudder. You're waiting on the scaffold while your assistant and two guards are escorting the gamekeeper. He is barely walking, almost falling down, tripping on the last step of the ladder leading to the scaffold as you sit there, belching wildly. He tries to catch himself but falls and utters a painful groan, then almost instantly he stands up proudly. When you grab him to escort, the, escort him to the noose, he spits on your boots, showing the disgrace towards the person who has taken him off, taking him through suffering of the he suffering the of <laughs> Okay, okay, we still need more proofreading here because that sentence I mean, it's th almost three lines. When you grab him to escort to the noose, he spits on your boots, showing the disgrace towards the person who has taken him through suffering the of hell, but could not break him completely. You put him by the shoulder to the middle of the to the middle of scaffold, and he steps there, indifferent to what is going on around him. The gloomy rain, roaring crowd, impatient mumbling of your assistant. Only your question about the last words grabs his attention. Not paying any attention to the onlookers of the town square, hungry for the confession of the criminals, he whispers, I'm leaving in peace, knowing that after myself, I'm leaving the most beautiful, pure creature, my gentle flower, my girl. He coughs, continues almost pitifully, I have never met anyone so merciful, pure and wonderful. I have given her everything I could, taken care of her, protected her. She will be crying so much when she finds out I'm gone. Who will take care of her? Not knowing who he is talking to in his days, you turn him towards the crossbeam with the noose you have to hang. No, with the noose you have just hang. The sea of people's mo the sea of people moves, turning it scary, distorted by an ugly happiness. Faces to you. <laughs> Fucking hell! Ah, oh. many are eating. Some are waving around bottles with wine, generously dropping drops on their dropping on their neighbors' kids. Are Wait, generously dropping drops. Ah, this causes me this causes me fucking pain on occasion. Kids are yelling with ex excrement. No, excitement. Homeless with bags full of rotten fruits. Lumberjacks and carpenters with sweaty and red faces. Hysterically laughing prostitutes. <laughs> Everyone gathered here shares a blind desire to see death and get drunk on the victim's suffering. Ah, so now we get to choose uh, the length of the rope. And you know what? This guy hasn't been a complete shit. I, I always personally thought poaching was such a bullshit crime to get fucking murdered for. It's like, oh, it's the king's day. It's like, the king is fucking spherical. I don't think it matters if he can't have that particular stag. Like, it's... I mean, deer are still kind of a pest. Like, it's not it's not the fucking end of the world. But, oh, god damn it. He gets the long drop. I don't want to cause this poor fucker to suffer. There we go. Sanity minus five, but it would have been worse if I'd done the other one. You turn away, pulling the rope until the body does not show on top of the hatch. The gamekeeper's body slowly sways in the noose. 
The crowd screams and demands the dance of the hanged man. Pieces of garbage and rotted food fly into are flying into you? <laughs> You're just standing there just going, ah, as a rotten tomato just flies straight down your throat. You see disgrace is the faces of the crowd. They have gathered here for you and you have not lived up to their expectations. Circle of ugly faces disappears. The crowd is leaving the town square, shrouded in, unsat in the unsatisfied thirst for blood. Not getting the expected entertainment from you, people will be trying to find some amusement by themselves tonight. Jesus fucking Christ. Were people really this bad at this time? Bunch of fucking psychosexual sadists. Rope plus one. <laughs> da na na na. <laughs> Unfortunately, my sanity is a bit fucked at the moment, so I may want to go home and have a bit of a rest. <laughs> right. Scoochie, scoochie. You sense that something is wrong when near the house. There's a steely... Something is wrong when you are near the house. There's a still grey stripe of, of stranger smell. Neither one of, the, neither one of the assistant or the guardian or the ones who searched the house the night before father's execution. You put the self-confident, cruel smell to the memory and move your gaze along it to the porch. Uninvited guest put a sheet of paper in the space under the door. Now, this isn't the worst translation I've read. It's legible. It's very grammatically poor, but it is leg legible, but... This really feels like you guys could maybe just oh, publicly release, like, the base Russian and let someone translate it. Because there's, there's, a, there's a heady whiff of Google Translate coming off of some of this, I'm just saying. You go inside the house and spread the letter on the table. Neat, sharp letters, smell of metal, and expensive paper glints dimly. How does it gl How does something glint dimly? <laughs> Ding! But well, it's, it's... I mean, it's like, dong! It's like, what the fuck? Oh. Kind sir, I offer you my condolences deep from my heart, and by request of my friends. The way your father was treated is shop... The way that your father was treated, not the way your father was treated, is shocking. Because that just means the way is shocking with this monstrous cruelty. Never mind. That is life under the tyrant's heel. There is a difference between the sternness with which the just monarch must show towards his subjects and the permissiveness inherent to the madman in power. Yes, that's the life in the state which happens to be our homeland. But it is in our power to change that. It will, not, it will take not one or two days, but people will rise from their knees and will fight for a better life for everyone. If you find yourself in agreement with such an opinion, and are ready to take arms other than the tool of your trade, then you should find a good fellow who takes questions of the Resolution's friends in his arms in the tavern on the palace square. Should you find yourself unable to sit on your hands sullenly, and are ready to act for us and our comrades to see the dawn of justice and freedom, then the same man will advise you a course of action to benefit the common cause. Save this letter from prying eyes, it will open many of the city's doors to you. It is not signed, but instead of the signature, the symbol is drawn in fine strokes. A young woman with a beautiful fa beautiful but stern face with broken chains on her wrists. You study the letter, but see no false in it. The writer wants, you to, wants to see you among his allies. It seems... rebellion? Who is he? Has it been the cause of father's death? You are lost in guesses. One is for sure. In case of a new search, if someone will find this letter, you will go to scaffolding even faster than your father and not in an execution role. Now, holding on to the letter, I'm assuming, allows me to get easier access to the revolutionary stuff, but I'm not a fucking idiot. I understand burn after reading as a fucking opsec. So, yeah. Spend a lot of time sitting at the table, staring at your hands, until you can no longer see the calluses on your fingers in the gathering twilight. Your head is empty. After dark, someone knocks at your door. You have to stand up and light the torch. It's the assistant. Behind his back a grey short, grey horse shuffles his shoes, worried about its dreary load. I have brought the gamekeeper's body and his belongings. The body. Well, the body smells of violent death, shit, urine, and just a bit of rot after a day spent under the rain in the town square. You hang the torch over the door and carry the body down into the basement. Well that's dinner sorted. <laughs> money! Money, money, money! Your assistant follows you like a shadow. When your hands are free, he tosses you a purse. You'll pay for the last day of the gamekeeper's life. The assistant spent the whole day watching over the corpse in the square, then took it off the noose and brought it here. But it is you who gets paid for the execution. Weighing the purse in your hand, you remember the law. The apprentice's work is paid, paid for at the rate decided by the master. Sometimes the latter decides to save on expenses, refuses to pay anything to his students. Despite his old age, the assistant is still registered as a student of the royal executioner. And now you are his master by law. 
I feel like half the fee seems like shit, because I'm the one going slowly insane. Quarter seems fine. I'm not going to be a cheapskate and not give him anything. Your assistant's wrinkly face breaks into an ugly smile. He says thank you with tears in his eyes. You realise that your father had never paid him that much. Maybe this was the reason why the relationship had always been so tense. It is not easy to spend years apprenticed to a man who doesn't value at all, takes any opportunity to humiliate you and never teaches you any professional secrets. This idea is unpleasant to you. You quickly nod to the old man and turn away. Getting up to the porch, you grab the torch from its sconce and get ready to head into the house. The assistant backs off to his cart, seemingly guessing your thoughts. Not saying a word, he climbs on the box, and with a tired sigh, the horse takes him away into the night. He's gonna get drunk and laid! Probably in that order, possibly not. Possibly simultaneously, you never know. Alright, speaking of getting laid, the uneven light of the candle is enough for your keen eyes when you examine what you've got for today. Well, let's have a look at the body. <laughs> I could not... Hello, Rufit. Oh, sorry, hang on a second. Yeah, let me, uh, slightly... Pop that down to 40. Hopefully that's any better. That's a little bit better. The gamekeeper lies naked and his wax-like paleness is accentuated by so many cuts and bruises. Most of them are your own work. Especially conspicuous is an uneven dark band running around the neck. The rope mark. You have no idea whatsoever how much a body can be worth. This here is a fresh one, not decomposed yet. But how much does it matter to those who are eager to pay for de dead bodies? What kind of person would be buying bodies? An unscrupulous medical man? A sorcerer? A jaded aristocrat looking for some fun with dead flesh? A mad collector? You don't feel like guessing. Well, let's have a look at the belongings. You step to the side and examine the scarce possessions of the gamekeeper. Here is the leather vest he was wearing, old but in good condition. Hat with a shabby feather, quilted pants and good boots still dirted by the forest soil. Everything is too small for you, and it will be impossible to alter for your size, but the used cloth trader from Iron Street will be interested in these items. Unlike the dead body, items made out of a good leather and sturdy cloth are easy to sell. They have a set price and don't perish over time. The trader simply cuts the price in half for holes and scrapes. It's much easier to find a buyer for a... Is it much easier than, than to find a buyer for a corpse? Right... The corpse has no, has <laughs> the corpse has hot hotting special com <laughs> to those bodies you've seen before. Fucking hell! When f helped father when helped father to wash them. Christ! Now it's your work completely, and you have no reasons to be ashamed of it. You study the body and be to be sure that the assistant hadn't damaged it before bringing it to you. You remember that the old man often is in a strange mood. But it looks good. You leave it to examine your father's diary at last. You never asked where the corpses from your basement go. Sometimes in the morning, after the execution, the relatives of the execution executed would knock on your door, and father would sell them the body for a high price. Sometimes he took the body somewhere himself. Uh... You ought to sell bodies to relatives of diseased criminals. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so do we go with peace of mind? Or do we go with... I mean, fuck it, science! Hell yeah, let's f let's further medical... Let's further the Age of Enlightenment rather than just be a fucking asshole. Upstairs... <laughs> Upstairs you s sit at the table with a big candle and lean over, di over the diary with your hands trembling. You've seen the book, but Father never let you ever... Let you Eve to hold it. So it's the first time when you open it till today. You turn the pages carefully, searching the topics you, you interest, that interested you. you <laughs> I feel like I'm having a stroke trying to read this. I feel like Middle Brown is always the short option. I'll go full deviant and lots of talk. Hey, look, I'm going science deviant, okay? I don't, I don't give a shit about the politics. I want to become like the fucking Leonardo da Vinci of, of nobbling people's skulls, all right? <laughs> Can't just dip one testicle in the fondue. What if you lost the last one in a previous fondue accident? Or a tapenade accident, I don't know. <laughs> the, old the old cemetery secrets, the occult. Oh, fucking hell, right. Cemetery secrets, occult, or corpse, but I mean, just generally fencing that shit doesn't seem like particularly interesting. Poking around with them under my own time, that seems fuck off, Disco Elysium. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to play you yet. 
Father writes, the old cemetery is a place where only the bravest dare to visit. Smoke and vapour rise above the graves from cracks in the rock. Its sources are the underground fire. The cemetery has a form of a spiral. Any part of it could crumble under the weight of a person. That's why the chapel is abandoned. That's why the graves of ancient kings and generals are being overgrown with heather and ivy. Now, townsfolk bury their dead men on the new cemetery to the east of the old one. According to the city legends, only the oldest gravekeepers know reliable pathways between the deadly cracks in the ground. Looking carefully, you see the drawing that resembles a spiral, spotted by the short lines and signs beaded runes. So, so, uh, ah, never mind. Obviously, this is a map of the cemetery. If you were to trust your father's notes, and if there have been no new cracks appearing in the ground, you could follow this map and safely get to the middle of the spiral where the chapel stands. On the other hand, in the darkness, surrounded by the smoke and vapour and uneven light of the underground fire, you might get lost, not being able to find the right turns. How brave or reckless you should be to take the risk of walking around in the old cemetery at night. I'm very nice, we get to read up on all of them. That's kind of cool. Leonardo. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's in the Titanic, the Aviator, well, a bunch of, bunch of good shit. Soon enough, you find a note about corpses. <laughs> Just under his, in his shopping list. Eggs, eggs, milk, cadavers. Our beneficial... Our Beneficent Church, by spreading new faith over the whole country and among the allied independent states, has, re has, re has released special edict which urges to protect the holiness of the human body from the, from the tough with the unclean. What? According to that edict, only priests and executioners have the right to touch the dead bodies. Just undulating. I'm just like, ah, I love the fact that I can do this. <laughs> People who, only, who work with corpses and do not have any relationship with these two professions or do not possess a special king's order will be executed through cutting off their arms and hanging. Okay. Your father was always indifferent towards the clerics. There is no way he paid any attention to these laws if breaking them could feed you both. Through all these years, you should have been able to find reliable buyers who are ready to pay for, for the bodies. Thinking about your father makes you feel the loss and emptiness in your chest. Finally, next to the half-erased drawing, you find something resembling an address. Old Cemetery After the Sunset. A bit lower is the another word. Donuts. It has to be a name. This word, as you know, translates from the southern dialect as the Big Donut. You have already seen a story of how to t sell the dead bodies somewhere among the pages. Your father in detail described how he was given a signal after the execution of one murderer. It was a candle placed on the south window of the abandoned chapel in the old cemetery. Maybe this method of contacting the buyer is still functioning, and you will be able to sell the body. You should get up the hill behind the house and look, up, look at the chapel windows. Many aristocrats are interested in the occult, walking the thin line between the study of ancient culture and a heresy. You have They have money, so the deal will be profitable, even if it's against the law. Your father was careful. The signalling system on the cemetery was probably developed by him. Nobody will be there after the sunset, and if someone will be later caught with the body on their hands, they will end up in your dungeon anyway. You put on your jacket, wondering what to do if the candle flame really burns at the window of the chapel in the old cemetery. Should you take the body to father's mysterious buyer, or should you wait until morning when the gamekeeper's relatives arrive to take his body? Well, I suppose I'm going to the ruins. Okay, the hill overlooks the old cemetery. Labyrinths of cracks light up the night with flashes of underground fire. Fog mixed with fumes from the bowels of the earth. In the centre of the cemetery, in the window of a dilapidated chapel, candle flame flutters. Interesting. Fresh air makes you feel a bit better. It's unlikely that they've already bid it buried father. Tomorrow you'll learn the fate of his body. For now, you might as well take a walk and let the morbid thoughts drift away into the night sky. So let's look at cases quickly. Still haven't gone to conclusion or verdict yet. I'm kind of surprised by that. Right. Ascend the hill and take a look at the old cemetery. Anchorhead. Interesting. <laughs> Hanging harmless now we're talking. <laughs> mm, that's, that, that's that fucking full-flavoured medieval bullshit. Behind the house, a narrow street climbs uphill, soon becoming little more than a heather-grown path. Even in the old times, before this neighbourhood was abandoned, this place saw little traffic. Nowadays, skeletons of neglected houses, those that haven't yet collapsed under the weight of time and desolation, keep rare passers-by away better than those angry dogs. At the top, among flat stones protruding from the ground like some old bones, the only company is provided by coarse, thorny grass, biting wind, and distant sounds of the city. The hilltop overlooks an ancient meadow known among locals as the Black Heath. 
Your acute senses perceive tendrils of smoke ahead. Their ghostly fingers rise from faintly smouldering pits. The chapel sticks out ahead like a lonely jet black fang, its angular silhouette easily discernible even in the dark. The chapel's square foundation becomes visible through a tear in the shroud of nightly fog. A light flickers in the basement at, in the basement sash, at this distance hardly different from a cold fluorescence of underground fire. You strain your eyes to see that this is indeed a candle flame. This means that even in the dead of night, a customer is waiting in the chapel with his coins. The view of deceivingly peaceful cemetery drives you into melancholy. An acute feeling of loneliness and loss overwhelms you for a moment, followed by a new thought. Extra coin would be welcome, but it's not everything. Perhaps you'd better bury the body of the one whom you have tortured to death in duty bound, so that his much suffered soul would, at last, find peace. Fuck this, I'm going home! <laughs> Fuck this shit, I'm out! <laughs> On the way back, you keep a brisk pace. Small stones slide from under your feet and roll down the slope. Through the r their rattling, you barely register another, almost inaudible sound. Someone is shadowing you, hiding in roadside bushes. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> I'm half full of politics, but well viewing conscience. Meh, nah, none of that, none of that weak shit. How is this weird? It's a bit of the old loot. Bit of the old hurdy gurdy. Uh, let's wait and see. It. I, I, I'm not assuming someone's trying to murder me yet. It feels a bit premature. Hastening your steps, you turn towards home, but not fast enough. Evil green lights that have just glistened through the bushes suddenly appear quite close. Your shoulder strikes against the fence under the weight of another's body, while sharp teeth close up on your forearm. A huge dog, gaunt, old, and evidently sick, pulls your arm with a hungry snarl. The, ski the skin chills belatedly on your throat. This is where the beast aimed initially. How come your sense of danger has failed to warn you of the attack? At last, you manage to grab the canine firmly by the scruff of its neck and throw it away. The dog hits the ground with a hoarse growl, then springs up and, limping, breaks downhill through the bushes, casting a weird glance at you. Feeling a pulsing pain in your arm, bitten to the bone, you decide against chasing the dog through the night. <laughs> Got fucking bit! I'm a werewolf now! <laughs> it's not stealing pets! It's not quite the same if they try and, like, <laughs> just try and nosh my fucking arm. Let's just have a look at my character. Can I actually... Okay, it's it's fucking night, all right? It's the middle of the night. I'm at the house. Can I please learn some skills? I have absolutely no idea how the fuck the, the, the actual upgrading thing works. But, uh, okay. Oh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Too close to fucking home. Also, has this been fixed? Okay, that's been sorted. I think. Oh, they've just, they've just straight up disabled that. The Gamekeeper's course. Value... N value, oh dear. Whatever hanging man brings luck and treat of female infertility, as people say, so it costs a lot of money. No, I can't use it there. Okay, fine. Also, oh, I can actually put. Can I just put the. The fuck is that? I'm assuming I can possibly, like, disassemble the poor fucker for parts. You come to your house. On the road near gates, two fallen elms become the barricade. You easily get through burnt branches and suddenly hear the voices near the gates. There are two men on the road. You can clearly see them. The first one, lantern in hand, is visible at the gates. Another one is behind, almost indistinguishable in the dark. There is the bag with the notes of chemicals and herbs in his hand. The big knife is glowing in another. He's much smaller than the first man. You look at his hulking silhouette, unpleasantly surprised. You've never seen a man so big and impressive. He's on par with you in both height and constitution. Whatever they are waiting for, you will lose your advantage in the moment you'll step into the circle of the lantern light. And this, too, could be a real trouble in a fight. Ah, I mean... <laughs> so really wanted to make a morgue rolly outy corpse storage thing. I mean, I guess. <laughs> Aggressively self-adopted. <laughs> You're my dad now! Realise it wouldn't look like anything from off screen, so I decided to have the slab roll out from under the cops. <laughs> Fuck it, it works! Let's just say hello. You feel the bright and itchy sense around this uninvited guest. The short one wears the leather apron with stains deep. A butcher. He should be good with his knife then. 
But why holding it in a hand if they are here for the harmless reason? The butcher is humbly listening while his giant companion is telling something about grey flies scratching his black beard. You're not sure about the meaning of his words. The man's clothes sound like a fortune in novelty. It's good and nice materials. Shiny silver buttons. Expensive boots. His hands are gloving with the same si are glowing with the same scent as the bag in his first man's hands. It's medicine. What do you want here? You call from a place you are hiding without closing the distance. The butcher is shaking and holds a grip on his knife handle. The big man raises his large hands, waving to your direction, and shouts into the darkness. The Honourable Royal Executioner, I suppose. Don't worry, my servant will put his weapon away. The short, tough guy hesitates, but does as his master says. I'm here for, here for business, if you don't mind. You step silently into the halo of dim yellow light, and the man that addressed you involuntarily backs away. And what do you want? It feels novel to look at someone without lowering your eyes. The man holds a portable lantern with a flaring candle inside. Raising it higher, he examines you impertinently. He is wearing a strange he is wearing strange looking glasses. Are, are you hurt? His voice is as impressive as his bulk, sounding not unlike a bear's growl. Teeth marks just above your wrist throb with pain, but you do not move your eyes away from the thugs standing in your path. You can hear the one behind the lantern bearer shifting from one foot to another. A thick set and sturdy fellow, he looks small next to his companion, and it is he who is carrying carrying a heavy bag. Both wear dark-coloured cloaks, reaching to their heels, somewhat similar to priest's robes. A wicked wound, says the first stranger nonchalantly with his deep voice. Animal bites shall be treated with utmost care and as soon as possible. Perchance you need help. Reading distrust in your face, he raises his free hand to pull off his hood. You glimpse a massive gold ring with a red jewel adorning his little finger. I'm a doctor, you see. Pleased to meet you. His well-shaven forehead reflects the flickering moonlight. His eyes meet yours, and you suddenly hear muffled sounds similar to those emitted from the torture chamber. Moans of pain and terror. This is how frightened animals scream before they die. You feel acute metallic taste on your palate, and a phantom weight of a blood-slick axe handle in your hand. Let's have a look at this. Ah, uh, I mean, to be fair, the fuck are you doing here? Why the hell are you milling around my house in the dead of night? Show more respect to you, spawn of the gallows, rumbles the giant's companion from behind his back, lest you would part with some teeth. Perhaps you are never going to gain respect for those who consider your trade unclean, but you can still instill fear in them. The surgeon puts his hand against your shoulder when you take a step forward. Well, well, let us not. My companion has got excited, he says gently. Please forgive him. We are only guests here. The sturdy fellow scowls at you from behind his master's back. A steel grip holds, you, holds your shoulder. Answer politely. You glare at the fellow for some more time. So many vulnerable spots in his body. Then you shrug the surgeon's hand off and say reluctantly, Next time he'll part with some of his own. The fellow perks up again, but his master only gestures him aside. Of course, he replies in a soothing tone. Please understand that my people are worried when I am spoken to rudely. My companion doesn't know you yet and doesn't trust you, but I hope we'll fix it pretty soon. Why should we quarrel? Uh, what are you up to here? You wanted to see me? For one long minute, the surgeon watches you silently. You feel the tension radiating from his massive bulk dissipate. At last, he nods composedly. To business, then. I see that you are not very fond of making friends. Perhaps you'll be interested in profit. I have an offer for His Majesty's Executioner. Let's talk inside. Several minutes later, the two of you are sitting in your kitchen. The air smells thickly of blood and herbs. Your hand has been washed above a bowl, treated with wormwood tincture, and bandaged tightly. Your guest indeed shows great skill in treating wounds. His grumpy companion has remained at the gates. The surgeon took the heavy chest from his hands as if it was weightless. Now it rests on a chair nearby, open, and you can glimpse many vials of dark glass and dimly glittering metal tools. You'd better find the dog and kill it, speaks the guest. If it carries the disease known as hydrophobia, it may cause much grief. As the owner of the slaughterhouse, the one beyond the great pasture gates, have you been in the neighbourhood? I have dealt with rabid animals many times, so I know quite well how dangerous and contagious the malady is. The dog was weird indeed. You shrug your shoulders. Drinking up the remains of the tincture without even wincing, the physica leans towards you confidently and says, By the way... Tomorrow my slaughterhouse is going to host a most inter interesting event of a mystical character. For you it will no doubt be very educational and profitable to boot. You and your breathless friend will be honoured guests. 
He goes silent suggestively and makes a gesture as if hanging himself by the neck, hinting at the gamekeeper. <laughs> Not so much subtle if he's just going, at the dinner table, but sure. Of course, he continues, seeing that his message has been received, I will pay handsomely for your contribution to the ceremony. But this is not the main point. I will dare say that no one throughout the kingdom practices rituals, yes, rituals, of the kind we can hold with, we can hold with the help of your dear, dead friend. <laughs> rituals? Do you really believe in such bullshit? <laughs> I like this. I like this surly, snarky fucking guy. <laughs> Woefully plus one. Hell yeah! Rituals? Do you really believe in such bullshit? The searcher's accomplice frowns at you, while the man himself lets out a chuckle. <laughs> you are indeed unlike your father. My father was a man of learning, but his education left room for certain eccentricities. The church does not approve of such things. Believe in executioner. It take believe in executioner. It takes very little to land up in my torture chamber on charges of heresy. Your visitor smiles broadly. Then come, all the more so. Perhaps we can even perhaps we even have more in common than I dare to hope for. And bring the body. I will pay handsomely. And the surgeon bids goodbye. Time for me to go. Don't neglect your wound and try to find the dog. If it really carries the disease, you'd better know about it. Good night. He holds out his calloused hand so confidently that you offer yours, and only feeling a firm handshake, you realise that this is the first time you have ever treated like this. People don't shake hands with executioners. Aren't you unclean creatures, forever stained with blood and death? Why, even to say greetings to a headsman, to wish him health, or to meet his eyes is considered a bad omen. And yet this powerful man, richly clad and harbouring strange ideas, converses with you as if you were equals. You don't know how to return a compliment. Nodding awkwardly, you leave the surgeon at the side of the road in the company his lantern and his accomplice and suddenly go home, still pondering over your new acquaintance. I want to date the surgeon. He sounds really nice. Sorry. Ah, <laughs> uh, I... He's weird. So weird you would like to learn more about him. Yes. Get the van. From your childhood, you needed less sleep than the father. He used to spend nights at work, fulfilling his tasks. Today you have nobody else to tell you what to occupy hands and mind. You'll have to choose yourself. Masturbate. Oh, fuck! Okay, well, apparently now this is the main story. <laughs> fuck! Okay, so we've got shits of stuff we can do. So we can go straight to the slaughterhouse. That's where we can go if we want to start talking about revolution. Although I've burnt the letter, so... Ugh. Let's see. So the old... Okay. Ah, so now I can do stuff. Okay. Food entitlement. Yes, give me food. And... Give me waifu. <laughs> I'm a terrible person. Upgrades. Oh shit, I can actually upgrade my place as well. Nice. Nearly <laughs> gonna team for your knob tip. <laughs> Muzzle Tom, I guess. <laughs> you hear the floorboards creak as you move along the house. Before this house came to your grandfather's possession with the title of executioner, it belonged to some warlock. <laughs> Fucking hell. Father grew here. <laughs> he was only five foot two when he arrived, he was fucking six foot one afterwards. It's drafty and doors slam with a wall shaking force, and the old tree scratches the roof. But this is your place. It's safe and familiar. Grandfather and grandfather have changed it for their liking during their lives. Now it's your turn. Okay, coal chamber. The executioner's house is located on a cliff. It once allowed the construction to avoid a misery of all surrounding streets. Solid stone left intact, whereas the soil, that is more docile by its nature, is ha has all covered with deep cracks and smoking cauldrons. But now you see the problem. It is convenient to store supplies in cold cellars and basements. You, in turn, besides food supplies, have to be concerned about the corpse that delivered to you from the execution block. It is difficult to deal with a dead body rotting. Cold caves under the royal palace preserve corpses longer, yet no one will allow you to keep them there. Finally, you find a solution. The basement can be walled off in the back and furnished with big wide shelves, one above the other, to store the corpse. The floor can be covered with straw or dry moss to collect moisture, and under the roof a small narrow window can be installed. You know well how much gases a corpse emits. <laughs> Immortal assholes hogging up all the good rent flats. Never move out, never got that time. <laughs> oh dear. 
Okay, let's have a look at some of this other stuff. An expensive but very useful invention that allows managing your time properly. A beautiful wooden case promotes reliability and protects a clockwork from humidity. A clockmaker in Embassy Row gives a hum of appropriation, after naming a price and even promises to make a pendulum in the shape of a tiny metal hatchet. <laughs> That's adorable, I want one! <laughs> a clock must be winded up every morning according to the bells and striking clock tower so that it can inform you of the correct time by metric ticking similar to the sound of small bones tapping. The assistant swears for a long time after seeing you at the entrance to the store. According to him, it once belonged to his family until they went broke and sold it. He's not lying, but you can't see why he hates the current master watchmaker. A man still isn't really old, with a monocle in his watery left eye. Hmm, so we've got some different things. I can imagine that possibly allows me to do more stuff in a day by managing my time better. Food. Your mother died giving birth to you and your... F <laughs> Your mother oh, the commas are not in the right place here. Your mother died giving birth to you, and your father and your father has never had another woman on your memory. There weren't even a trace of their presence. That was the cause of the hearse unkemptness and plainness of the food. You and your father have always cooked by yourselves and have always done it badly. You never cared about his diet, and you have never learned how to run the household and how to care about your stomach, and you have entirely forgotten about the existence of hot meals after his death. It's time to change that. Your old copper pot lies by the fireplace, its surface is pitted and covered in scratches, and its awkward handle have regularly burned your hands during the childhood. But you have come to like this bad-tempered old cooking utensil. <laughs> so I can get myself a nice new kitchen. I wish I wasn't a grown blonde-haired man by this old poor woman's <laughs> putting the bathroom I'm sorry, what?! <laughs> I have missed some things here! Where exactly has your train of thought been going? I think it derailed. Father's bedroom. Shag pad. Upgrade. Father's bedroom is the central room of the house. It's too small for your liking, but it's warm there. The still father scent, almost unnoticeable and too familiar, and it makes you think about your childhood. There was no angel hanging over father's bed despite the regulations. You asked father about it some day, and he answered that angels were here in your grandmother's time, and all that, and all that this faith of Gotra was only madness and death. All you could make of his words was the fact it's not grandmother he wants for, but he never explained his meaning. <laughs> Fucking warlocks, goddamn! Instead of the angels and the passages from the prayer book, there were there was the ambulant hanging at the head of his bed. Father had always told that it guards his sleep. You remember that the father, after father's execution, he found signs of the search in your house, and there were even more of them around the bed, but the amulet was already gone. And several books and instruments have gone missing from the shelves, where your father kept his most prized possessions. After you've taken over Father's title, the whole house and his room are rightfully yours. You think that you will become closer to Father when you take his comfortable, if little short, bed. You were considering moving your narrow bed to make space for your long legs, but you have found deep scratches on the wooden wall. Someone, who was kept in this closet, desperately tried to widen the crack between the old boards. You have only to hope for this man to be kept here before your family moved in. But your instinct tells you that these scratches cannot be more than 20 years old. Maybe you are better to tear the wall between the bedroom and your closet down. The house will be ridden of some of the dark pages of its history, and you'll be able to fit a big bed in the room and finally be able to sleep better. Uh, hmm. Fuck it, let's remodel. You can finally stretch in all of your height on the bed and sleep well. The house has changed a little. Return to the choices. Oh, I've got a picture on the wall as well. Home library. You are accustomed to keeping your mind in as firm hands as you keep your body. Father forced you to read much and thoroughly question the results. He liked to repeat the grandfather burned out at work because he was not a good executioner and he had nothing, knew nothing of the intricacies of the trade. He was just chopping heads. Father was different. He studied books on medicine and anatomy, historical chronicles and treaties written in old languages. In father's, di in father's diary there is a list of books that, in his opinion, the Royal Executioner's Library must be composed of. Some of them he was able to procure in the years of service, and as a child you have learned to read by the anatomical atlas. You have never heard of some of them. Nonetheless, you have to work hard to get them. To be a good executioner, you have to know at least no less than he knew. However, your, ex your curiosity tells you that besides his books, there are hundreds of others you know nothing about. Maybe this time you should not go by the road laid out by your father and learn something that will help you understand people better. Fuck it, new books! <laughs> Kama Sutra. 
Books tell you about the city and its inhabitants of the world beyond the city walls. I also been changed a little. There we go. Okay, we've still got more and more stuff to do, but that's that's okay for the moment. Let's leave it there. Let's see, upgrades, ba 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 ba. Wait, old faith? Sheol, unknowable, great, terrible. How many epithets of the one who used to be called with fear and love? All mother. She gives power, but she takes everything in return. She reminds that, that everyone except her chosen children will soon return to her and be devoured by her servants. This name, like other pagan shrines, is under such a strict ban by the crown of the church that for merely mentioning it can get you charged with heresy. Most people now do not remember those dark times when the capital was ruled by pagans and their bloody deities. Yeah, we've got lots and lots of stuff added on here. Okay, we've got some... I'll quickly go through a few other little bits here. The old master of the slaughterhouse was famously rich. He made his fortune when he built a meat factory near the river gate. He hasn't even got a clue that his main treasure, not the money that went to his moronic heir, who became a doctor at his father's insistence, is the land which the Lord Slaughterhouse stands on. That is the real history of the city. The young master of the Slaughterhouse is a wealthy, eccentric man who cares for his people well. After graduating from the University of Medicine, he devoted himself fully to the family business and spent huge sums of money on upgrading the Slaughterhouse. Same. Big mood. Uh, I believe we've done the king, the judge. The young judge, who doesn't seem to be an experienced courtier at first glance, but hears much and controls much, is a good choice as the successor to the country's chief judge. The king can't make a move without his consent, and the queen is doing everything in her power not to let him get any real power. Fat, evasive, and inarticulate like a cloud in the sky, the judge radiates friendliness. His readiness to help looks suspicious, but he doesn't seem hostile or dangerous. He looks curious. He behaves as a long-lived old man, and not like a former student. <laughs> Fucking Hades! <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, let's, uh, right, so, boot, boot. Ooh, okay, so, cosy bed. Having made one comfortable and spacious bedroom out of the father's room and your closet, you find that nightmares are now bothering you much less often. Health recovery plus ten, and humanistic library. Having decided to expand the library, you got hold of books that Father did not have. They tell you about the city and its inhabitants, about the world outside the city walls. Mental Resonance plus one. Interesting. Okay. Oh yeah, Charles Jewish Hades, isn't it? It's as close as they get as they get to hell, basically. To the map, to the map. All the shit in a box in the map. Uh, I mean, Plague Lake sounds entertaining. It's only one. The poor districts of the capital also need nightmen. Otherwise, the city will suffocate in sewage. But pay for the cleaning of the local smelly alleys is a meagre pittance. Let's go down to shit alley. You're walking around town. You're in for an unpleasant business. Dirty, ungrateful, and even dangerous. To work as a nightman and remove filth from the city streets. To, uh, to work as a nightman, even more shameful tasks than executions. However, it brings money, albeit small, but you are strong, undemanding, and you have nothing to do, so it's foolish to ignore this source of income. Your strength and endurance aren't very popular with the rest of the nightmen, who usually stick together against the town people, who despise them and hate, like you. But money is money. Okay, so we can work here if we want to. The bushes around the house are hard, aren't hidden threats. As long as an entire has experience, dangerous predators who cannot rest. Oh, fuck yeah, in fact, let's uh, try and sort out that bloody dog, shall we? Come here, Fard, I'm gonna fuck you up. <laughs> yeah, boy, gamekeeper lumps, get them while they're fresh. You remember the surgeon's advice and decide to track down the dog that attacked you behind the house. It's a wild dog, so there's no use trying to call it. Rather, you should make a simple trap, but you'll need bait. Meat vendors were obliged to give you and your father any pieces up to a quarter of beef, up to five carcasses of small game, but those privileges died as soon as your father did. You might still have some meat from the market, but this dog might require a lot. You look pensively at the trapdoor leading to the cold cellar, repurposed for corpse storage. There's enough flesh at your disposal. Well, let's hawk a lump over there, I suppose. You go down into the cellar, select, it, select a candlelight by a small hatchet with a sharp and bright blade, and approach the bench on which the gamekeeper's naked body rests, milky white in semi-darkness. How much will it now decrease in value? Taking your aim, you chop off the corpse's left arm above, at, the, at, the, at the elbow. We'll do it for a hungry dog. <laughs> Just lumps! 
You start making a snare, but soon realise it'd be easier just to dig a pit in the ground and cover it with two long boards. The surrounding streets are forlorn and empty. When people abandoned their residences, they took their stuff with them, on sleds or wheelbarrows, but the houses remained. You quickly find some boards. At last the pit is ready, with a board raised with a board held raised above it with a wooden support and a sweetish smell of meat emanating from below. You were not surprised when the bushes move, betraying the beast's approach, but you gulp once again at its size and its sickly look. It's hard to determine if the dog is really sick, but its old age and feral way of life seem to have conquered its will to live. Bald patches on its hide surround scabs and scars. Eyes are half filled with pus. Ribs rock out under the skin taut over lean flanks. The dog sniffs loudly, slides past you, and drops heavily into the pit. The whole scene reminds you of something vaguely familiar. Marking time to make sure you step to the trap and kick away the wedge. The boards sink upon the pit with a thud. The dog is a start, but continues to attack the piece of meat, its jaws shut tight, drivel gushing from its fangs. You drag a huge stone you have prepared for the purpose to the edge of the pit and lift the grate a little. One well-aimed throw will break the creature's neck and put an end to its miserable existence, after which you will have ample opportunity to examine the corpse. The dog suddenly raises its head, without letting the meat go, and looks up at you with mad yellow eyes. It wags its tail hesitantly. I'm going to hell! You lose, your aim, you lose your aim and the throw goes off. The dog manages to jump away with only its hind leg is hit by the fallen stone. The beast whines and jerks convulsively. White of the bone visibly sticks out from the open wound. It tries to free its leg, but to no avail. You look around, but don't see any other stone to finish the dog with. You'll have to either go down and break its neck, or just cover the pit and leave it there to die of hunger. <laughs> I once fished for people with a wallet stuck on a fishing rod. I guess this is how you do dogs. <laughs> I mean, ideally, if, if you don't have lumps of gamekeeper to hand, I guess there's other bit you can substitute anyone else. But oh dear, well, no, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna let the poor fucking thing starve to death. You jump down into the pit. If the beast, beast leapt at you, it won't come as a surprise. You won't let it bite you again. The dog whines. The ground under the stone is darkened, soaked with thick blood for the broken leg. Animals heal quickly if injuries are properly cared for, yet this dog won't manage to free its leg and won't have time to heal it. Meanwhile, the doomed beast yelps joyfully like a pu puppy and violently wags its tail in the dust. It looks frightening, but you suddenly realise that its bar teeth mean not a scowl, but a smile. For the first time in your life, someone professes love for you. The realisation is astonishing, although you don't understand the reasons. You've done much darker things in the last few days, but somehow the very thought of killing this dog makes your hand feel unbearably heavy. Some vague feeling stirs inside you. Oh, fuck that! You roll the stone aside, shove the winding dog out to the pick and climb out yourself. The dog follows you, hopping on three legs. At home, you find a new rope and, having once again estimated the dog's powerful stature, fold it in four. This way better. You turn the dog up near the back door. The animal does not resist, only wags its tail and watches you go with happy, puppyish yelps. The feeling that there is a creature, if only one with a pitiful one at that, that cares about you, that depends on you fully and is happy to obey, is heartwarming. You'll need to feed the dog, comb out cold the lamp from its hair and treat the inflamed scars on its sides and muzzle. I don't know if it's rabid or not. Look, to be fair, if it's already bitten me, I've already got rabies and at this point we might as well go mad and dead together. Disregard water, acquire papa. <laughs> right, so I've only got four hours left in the day. Let's go to the slaughterhouse now. <laughs> Why do you look so happy? I got a dog! Oh fucking hell, he's gone crazy. <laughs> Clatter of hooves heralds the arrival of your assistant. Grunting, the old man opens the gates and leads his horse and cart inside, calling for you to make haste. Right. I've got most of it left. <laughs> the assistant is more of a hindrance than a help. At last you manage to secure the shrouded body on the cart. The old man shakes his hands noisily. The voice drones like a swarm of stinging mosquitoes as he goes to the horse and starts untying the reins, thinking that you can't hear him. Promise to split the skin, but at the end of the day I'll work for two and you grab all the money. Where would you get tonight without me? To the first poor street? Well, lad, the folks here, they haven't seen a chunk of meat for such a long time, they won't waste a word. Just eat your cargo and the cart to boot. But you don't value help, do you? Where's my money, eh? 
He thinks you don't hear him. You cough loudly. The assistant shudders and turns to you with an ingratiating smile. Hey, look, you help, you get you, you get a fucking cut, mate. I'm not a, I'm not a prick. You point your finger at him. You'll have your money die by daybreak, but talk too much and goodbye to your teeth. Do you understand what you must do? The assistant shrugs away as if you've already raised your hand for a blow and sidles past the cart. Right, you nod approvingly. First, you must keep silence. You mumble something under his nose, but you can't discern his words. Let's go! <laughs> yes! How to make friends and kneecap people. This is how this is how we fucking go. The old mayor trots along obediently. You walk side by side, keeping your hand on a rickety board of the cart's bed and thinking about your customer. You yourself are not doing anything wrong. The body belongs to you and you have the right to sell it. Whether the surgeon has the right to buy your merchandise remains a mystery. This is not your problem, after all. If he is caught indulging in cannibalism, desecration, or witchcraft, you will have to talk about it in prison. Of course, if the rich there are special rules, the first one being, when money talks, the law keeps silence. He is going to pay well, which means he will have no problems with the law either. You have other things to worry about now. Poor neighbourhoods are even less peaceful at night than during daylight hours, and you are carrying a corpse through the streets and alleys where residents have little love for you. The night watchmen are likewise fond of other people's money, and they are harder to deal with than a couple of hungry urchins. The Tanner's Quarter Dirty and malodorous, the streets greet you with ghastly silence. Life seems to have stopped here at sunset. Workers have all gone to their quarters, and not a single soul can be spotted outside. Playing children, cautious cats, vagabonds hiding in the streets, all have disappeared. The cartwheels rumble as they hit the bridge spanning Vienne. Below, dirty foam on the water's surface looks like silver in the moonlight. You turn your head, sensing a red band of a familiar smell. Under the bridge from garbage strewn sandbanks, something is going on. Suddenly, an inarticulate cry comes from behind leaps of li heaps of litter interrupts the night's emptiness. The assistant whispers, hunching his shoulders. The tennis quarter ends here. Across the bridge is the butcher's domain. They don't like strangers. Leaning over the wide stone parapet, you see a trail winding along stinking garbage paths, red gleams of firelight, and shadows of men fighting. I ain't getting involved in that bullshit. You and your assistant lead the tired horse into the wide courtyard of the slaughterhouse. Even in this dead hours of the night, the place is buzzing with activity. Silhouettes of brawny butchers move between shadows cast by torchlight. Angry cries of goadsmen mingle with moans of cattle. An old goat looks straight at you with its indifferent yellow gaze, bunching on a wisp of hay. The surgeon soon comes out to you with his springy gait. He smiles broadly, waving aside his employees, trying to strike a conversation. Just the assistant will take the body. The surgeon quickly shakes your hand. Once again, he's treating you as his equal. You sense the bewilderment and fear of his workers behind your back. The assistant grunts, taking the body from the cart, and the surgeon turns to the sound. I only expected you, says the slaughterhouse owner. We don't need strangers here, but your companion can be fed while you are busy. The assistant cats, uh, casts a, a quick, avid glance at you. Uh, I trust this guy. He seems legit. There you go. Bugger off. Have something to eat. Chances are you will stay here for the whole night. Let the old man at least wait, wait when you stomach full, lest he would faint on the way back. You easily mount the body on your shoulder and follow the surgeon. <laughs> Just... Ah, GM Rufer. <laughs> Thank you with my hydrophobia. If I'm foaming by the end of this set, I'll know what's gone wrong. Do you hear? Go eat and wait for me here. Chances are you will stay here the whole night. Let the, let the old man at least wait... Uh, at least await you with his stomach full, lest he would faint on the way back. You easily mount the body across your shoulder and follow the surgeon. The assistant's muttering crawls across your back like a flea as you walk up the wide front steps of the slaughterhouse. You make yourself ignore the itching, focusing your attention on the surgeon's words instead. Do you hear how quiet it is? The work is almost done. Today, everybody did their best to finish before your arrival, so more cattle has been slaughtered than usual. He smiles pr proudly and points at the tall, gloomy walls around you. The ceiling of the hall you have just entered is covered in soot, though obviously it has been whitewashed pretty recently. The surgeon notices your silence and checks himself. Uh, perhaps you are interested in how everything runs here? Yeah, sure. You pass through a large chamber, thickly veiled with agony, fear and submission. A wide-moving belt driven by gargantuan gears runs across the entire hall and further on. The surgeon talks animately. When I inherited the place, I had to remake every many things here. Many worked in old fashion, slowly. It took years to train a butcher. Now I have workers numbering almost a hundred, each charged with his specific part. 
The most important work goes to proven masters. They are indispensable. But some tasks can be handled by a lad fresh from the countryside. With a single stroke of a hammer, a sturdy fellow stuns a bull who drops onto the belt. The surgeon rewards him with a nod, and the encouraged slaughterman smiles broadly, wiping sweat from his shiny bald forehead. I work here is my work is the most important. You don't stun the bull; he panics, and the meat comes out tough. Everyone knows that. This is one of the mo of the important posts, not the surgeon. Finish your job and come. Yes, master. The butcher answers eagerly. He seems unconcerned with either your presence or the dead body upon your shoulder. The surgeon continues. This is the so-called conveyor belt. It is employed at large mills. I have just improved the process. This is what allows my enterprise to run so successfully, but you are probably not so interested in fine details. Let's go. And to be completely honest, if I ever have to execute people at the point where I need a fucking conveyor belt, things have gone more drastically wrong than I was anticipating. In the next hall, a salty shroud is thrown over your eyes. <laughs> fucking lewd. Filled with a never-ending silent moan. Sorry, sillet moan. Several powerfully built lads hang cow carcasses on hooks by leg. Thick chain clanking carries them further, where stunned animals have their throats cut and their blood let out. Here you see a crimson stream quietly running along a gutter cut in a sloping floor. The water is pumped in, and once per day we wash everything into the river, and here is our master. A stocky butcher holding a long cutlass answers the surgeon's call with an incomprehensible bellowing. <laughs> A cameo of Arnold Schwarzenegger. With his brawny hands, knitted brows, and a wide forehead under a shock of dark curly hair, he lo himself looks like a bull. His empty stare is directed somewhere above the hooked animal. Grasping a horn with one hand, he makes a quick movement with the other, driving the cutlass upward with practically no swing. Blood fountains past him, leaving only some drops on his leather apron. The body continues to convulse while he indifferently quilts, uh, quits hold of the horn and looks for the next animal. You raise your eyebrows. A perfect movement. And a sign of satisfaction with the well done work. The surgeon notices your surprise. This is the murderer, a most honoured position. Each day, about 200 head of cattle pass through his hands. You try to imagine 200 persons being led up the scaffold one by one. No wonder the murderer's stare is so empty. Should this fellow end up in your dungeon, you would not waste time trying to extort the confession out from a madman. The chain clatters, you follow the movement of carcasses with your eyes. At the back of the next hall, a huge pile of bones with torn tendons looms white. A tired-looking elderly worker unloads another cartful of bones into the pile. In the meanwhile, the murderer finishes the last cow in a single stroke. Saliva gathers in the corner of his mouth and trickles onto the apron. In the stale air, a rusty, bloody note trembles like a thick veil. The sturgeon, the sturgeon, this gigantic fucking fish I'm talking to. The surgeon calls to the murderer, ordering him to join you. These guys are going to form a fucking boy band. Oh shit, I killed the bard. Oh no, there we go. You linger in the dark at the entrance of the hall, near a platform upon which rests a pyramid of cow heads. Having dealt with death throughout your entire life, you've never seen so much of it at once. The air seems soaked with a ceaseless dying groan. Pungent stench makes your hair stand on end. There's a difference between art and trade, drones a voice in your head, very similar to that of your father. Here we cut the carcasses, says the, says the surgeon. You squeeze yourself between containers filled with hooves, eyes and intestines. The surgeon steps over foul streaks on the floor with well-practiced dexterity. You, however, slip and press your head against something wet and spongy. The nearest container turns out to be full of bluish brains. The surgeon turns to look at you. Uh, careful, come here. I'd hate. I'd like you to meet my primary masters, who guard the secrets of the house. Ooh, Jesus Christ, a lot of text. He introduces you to the master butcher and his apprentices. A tall, black-bearded man with light-coloured eyes and a narrow face turns to you, wiping his large hands on a rag tucked under the strings of his leather apron. Standing above, standing next to him, two similar-looking old butchers with tough red faces give you probing looks, and again, no shadow of fear. These three reign over this crowded place. Working hands deftly execute habitual movements. A whole line of red-haired northerners disembowel animal corpses. Nearly agile, nearby agile dark-skinned highlanders saw carcasses in two. In the farther corner, several sulky women cut off tongues and sought pulled out intestines in the containers. These here are novices. They don't know the secrets of the trade and are so tasked with the simplest work, explains the surgeon, waving his hand ne negligently to stun a cow, to kill it, to make the first cut on its skin. This requires a master. 
He nods towards the centre of the hall, where the Master Butcher is keeping a close eye on groups of workers, urging them on with sharp cries. One of his apprentices uses a long, sharp knife to mark the cutting line to guide the saw. The other is waiting at the end of the file of butchers, each one of whom makes a cut with a chopper. Half-flayed hide uncovers whitish, subcutaneous fat. With his huge hands covered in spiral tattoos, the apprentice grabs the hide and pulls it off in one motion. The workers are viewing you unfriendly, but without the surprise that a body upon your shoulder would have evoc evoked in the city streets. Several foremen quickly disperse their subordinates and, having taken off their aprons, follow you. You pass a succession of chambers, through the glint of knives and surges of odours. The surgeon introduces you to those who join the tour of the slaughterhouse. Please be acquainted, my men you have already met. The master butcher and the murderer nod silently. Universal respect habitually drapes their shoulders. The surgeon, giving no pause, continues to call out names that mean nothing to you. They all greet you politely, even that gloomy stout fellow who accompanied the surgeon on the night of your acquaintance. You feel somewhat uneasy without the customary aura of threat. These men smell too strong of blood and too little of fear. None of the butchers following you was afraid of attracting bad luck by greeting you. You still notice familiar sparks of fear in the workers' eyes. It is not about you. It's about this place and the people that have become a part of it. You stop in front of an iron-bound door toward the farther end of the slaughterhouse. The butchers dutifully wait for their patron to turn the key. The surgeon comes closer and helps you remove the shroud. He looks over the corpse and nods approvingly. One of the butchers holds a torch high above the table. The surgeon scrutinises the body and then asks you, How is the body stored? Uh, prison first, cold cell analysis, and the corpse looks quite good. First in the prison, then in my cellar, not stinking too much, and thank goodness for that. The surgeon shakes his head in disappointment and sighs. He would be well served to place the body into a cold storage at the earliest opportunity. Otherwise, I'm afraid, it would be somewhat difficult for you to evolve as a professional. He raises his hand to become the sudden hubbub of voices. One way or another, this body will do, although not on the practical side, as I had expected. But it can still provide an illustration of the theory, and a very visual one. You will stay, won't you? He smiles at you. By joining a class, you will honour everyone present. A man of your profession would benefit from watching our studies. Yay! Oh, hello, Sol! How's it going? Uh, we, we finished the torture, and we're now about to have a medical lesson! Uh, seriously, like, for all I give the game shit about the translation not being very good, this is a very interesting world to be in, and I'm really enjoying it as a, as a setting. I will stay. Thirst for knowledge! <laughs> you decide, there's a faint mumble of a voice behind your back. The surgeon smiles broadly and gestures to attract everyone's attention again. Let's proceed with our topic then. Amputation is the skill of dismemberment, removing limbs and cutting joints and tendons. Let's consider it in more detail. The surgeon describes kinds of amputation, density of tendons in various parts of the body and the best angles for a saw to enter human flesh. He speaks about the importance, importance for speedy work, for the longer the operation lasts, the more likely it is the patient to die of the shock of pain. He shows a girdle with bite marks and narrates how last month a ten-year-old apprentice nearly bit through hard leather while they were sawing off his crushed arm. Keep in mind, this is a corpse before you, not a man alive. A piece of meat. It doesn't care anymore, just like the cows put to death by our master. You meet the murderer's gaze across the table. His face expresses the same dull patience with which he looked at yet another stunned bull approaching him on the conveyor belt. He half opens his mouth and you expect words to emerge, but there's only saliva, again dripping on his chest. A skill honed here will allow you to save lives, drones the surgeon's voice. Funny, you think, but I will put my knowledge to a different purpose. Meanwhile, there's some excitement among the audience. The eldest butcher steps forward and his patron nods to him, then turns to you. Let's have a competition. Let each of you choose a saw and uh, one of the legs. The winner gets a prime fillet. One of those we deliver to the royal kitchen. The eldest butcher stands opposite you, habitually pinning down the corpse's leg. You realise the uselessness of this action, but compose your thoughts and nod to show that you're ready. The eldest butcher nods simultaneously. You start. Win! <laughs> Oh, definitely. Like, uh, the, the, the torture thing is intended to be unpleasant. The whole idea is, like, I want to get through it, causing as little damage to these people as possible and without inflicting as any kind of unnecessary damage. But it's kind of the case of you are bonded to do this. It's up to you to work out precisely how bad you want to be. 
Not incompetent, just how much are you willing to lean into this to get results? As opposed to being good, but not doing your job. The dot job doesn't take long. You are used to work hurried up by your father's shouts or your victim's desperate moans. In a few strong movements, you easily saw through flesh, tendons and bone and pick up the amputated leg. There are worms feasting on the brown greyish tissue. Most of them are under skin, but you discern several pale flecks cl very close to the bone as well. Not at all troubled by your intrusion, they continue to feed without haste. You have won! My congratulations! The prize is yours! It will be put into your vehicle. The surgeon smiles and nods to one of his employees, while the elder butcher lowers his head in acknowledgement of his defeat. The butchers watch him with respect. Ask about head amputation. <laughs> Nothing for it, going to amputate the torso. And uh, what about head amputation, you ask? The surgeon laughs gloomily. <laughs> oh, of course, you must have asked. In medicine, this question does not bear much practical sense, but why not discuss the theory? He explains how to count cervical vertebrae and how the blade shall be aimed to guarantee neat decapitation. You listen to him, looking at the dismembered remains. The surgeon's detailed explanation turns amputation into a simple mechanical action. If all these students of his, his would digest in tonight's lesson well and attain the right to wield an axe, your services would not be so highly valued anymore. The surgeon makes the audience steer, solemnly proclaiming the dissection lesson finished. He gestures you to follow him and exits the door. You hurry after him, but at the last moment something makes you turn your head. The butchers are walking in a circle around the body, their hands prostrated above it. One by one, their fingers deep it, dip into cuts and smear their faces with coagulated blood. The eldest butcher holds two cross sickles above the dead man's head. Oh fuck, it's Dusk, dude! Run! The door closes with a bang, but the sight remains imprinted on your eyes. The surgeon calls after you. Ask where worms within dead body come from. Where do you think the worms within the dead body come from? The droning monologue about the functions of liver is interrupted by your question. The surgeon gives you a puzzled look. Oh, good question! Modical medical treaties say nothing of use on this matter, unless of course you believe in legends about divine properties of an organism. <laughs> in fact, the answer is simple, continues the slaughterhouse owner. A colleague of mine has conducted an interesting experiment. He took cuts of good fresh meat and put them into pots, some of which he covered with fine cloth. The meat started to rot. This attracted flies, and soon there were meat worms. But there were no worms in the pieces of meat that had been protected with cloth. The conclusion is obvious. Worms are larvae of flies and appear because of the latter, but never by themselves. There is no mystic self-generation involved. It is a purely natural, biological process. What if no flies settled on the corpse? You continue obstinately. How would the worms appear then? A few small flies might go unnoticed, might they not? The surgeon parries your question with his own. This is enough for thousands of larvae to appear. The butchers buzz worriedly. Men gathered in the room are pleased from your conversation, yet the surgeon's calm will restrain them from, from action. Eh. Oh, far from pleased with your conversation. Okay. You sense their surprise, aimed at you. None of them has ever asked the question, surgeon a single question, let alone dare doubt his words. Interesting. What if we retry this experiment? Oh no, absolutely, I can fully appreciate, like, this is the one thing that may go against the game in the long term, is... The game is a very interesting experience, but I feel like it would be dramatically uncomfortable. That's why I've put content warnings on the uploads I've done on YouTube. Very much specifically, because this is not a game some people will feel comfortable playing. And while that is the intent, I feel that giving people, like, doing a let's play of it, doing a streaming of it, so people can experience the story without having to make those decisions themselves, is completely valid, and I do not blame people for seeing this and going, looks cool, don't want to do that kind of thing myself. So, yeah, no, I can't I can't blame you there. But yeah, let's, uh... What if we retry this experiment, you ask, shouting down both the surgeon's words and the vibrating discontent of the butchers? Well, nothing should be taken for granted, and my words are no exception, the surgeon nods pensively. I have learned about this experiment firsthand, but I can't transfer my certainty to you. Always doubt, remember? Replicate the experiment. Isolate the body right after death and keep it in a sterile environment on clean sheets. And I implore you, share your findings with us. You nod abstractedly. This sounds easy. I, I don't mind. <laughs> We've got homework! <laughs> oh my god, I'm loving this. But what are your men doing there in the room? You ask him on your way towards the exit, unable to, unable to keep it to yourself. 
Oh, let's go. I'll show you the gates, the surgeon says absentmindedly, and suddenly turns to face you, his face all gloomy. If they are to find the body again, I will look into it. They are going to regret it. You see, old habits are slow to die. My men are ignorant. They think our anatomical studies are part of some mystic ritual. He cuts the air abruptly with the sharp of his hand. After all, I try to win over the most reasonable of them, like my aide, for instance. He is not prone to superstitions and accompanies me, accompanies me everywhere, adopting experience. With his help, I manage to battle the darkness in these men's minds. You remember the young surgeon's young assistant and the somber scent of glycosinkles and... <laughs> Let me try that again. You remember the surgeon's young assistant and the somber glint of sickles in the chamber. Ooh, 200. Nice. The surgeon nods and hands you the pouch for the pocket of his reach frock coat, covered it with a leather apron. Thank you. I really hope to see you again soon. And it's not only because of your commodity. There's... Think about becoming a permanent attendee of our gatherings. You put money in your pocket and nod. I will. And you turn to leave. You hide the pouch and raise your eyes at the slaughterhouse owner. Uh, I will think of it. Think of the following. The surgeon makes a broad sweeping gesture around the slaughterhouse yard. At these lessons, I teach people to see the world as it is, without pagan tales of figurative parables of the church. It is pretty arrogant on our part to think that the one and only spends all his time watching us and evaluating our deeds. The truth, I am sure, is much simpler. My brilliant colleague and revered teacher has written a book, wherein he presents a more reasonable scheme. Our world has been created in a momentous creative impulse, and since then has been evolving according to rational, natural laws. Our straightforward goal and duty is to study this great gift and perfect our knowledge of the world for the increasingly profound discovery of the magnitude and beauty of God's design. An elegant theory, is it not? You decide not to contradict. What's the name of the book? Principles of Philosophy. It is very educational. Nevertheless, I consider my teacher's magnum opus to be his rational method, wherein he proposed the principal, primary principle of scientific reasoning. Doubt. Doubt everything. Take nothing on faith. Assess and study. This is his testament and my creed. A surgeon feels inside his pocket and takes out a small book, expertly bound in quality leather. This is a copy from my exemplar. I am sure that in its pages you will find answers to many of your questions. No need to return. It's my gift to you. Books, especially so expensive, are a rarity for you. Your father's library contains only two dozen volumes, mostly treaties on history and medicine. The surgeon makes you a generous gift, even if everything written between the covers is nonsense. Man becomes the torture of a science! I mean, if you're gonna be doing unpleasant things to people anyway... It's not like I'm doing it for gits and shiggles. Holy shit, my worldview is so full right now. <laughs> Enlightened. I'm gonna be a one-man fucking renaissance. Watch this shit. You'll read the book. It's a curious opportunity to find out something new about the world. There wasn't such a book in your father's library, and you don't have to believe what you've read. You make a clumsy bow. The surgeon bows in return, and you headbutt each other awkwardly, and disappears inside the slaughterhouse gates. You walk down the front steps. The assistant is fast asleep, cuddled at the bottom of the cart. Nyaaah! It takes some time to shake him awake. In the end, you put both hands on the sideboard and shake the entire cart violently. The old man gives a start, and sits up. Looking far from pleased, he nevertheless obediently assumes his place at the raids and the horse slowly begins to pull the cart towards home. You almost reach the bridge when somebody calls you from behind. Looking back, you see a dozen butchers running up to you. Oh, fuck! Your assistant cowers in the front, clutching the reins with whitened fingers. But there is not a single spark of a well-known, sickly sweet feeling of danger. They only want to talk to you. <laughs> the group is headed by the eldest butcher. <laughs> I just fucking open my third eye and... <laughs> Thank you... Uh, <clears throat> sorry, butcher voice. Thank you very much for visiting us tonight on a matter of such importance. I beg you to help our patron further on. He is a great man who will pay handsomely for your efforts. He runs out of words and silence falls. Other butchers are crowding behind his back. All to a man have their eyes fixed on you. Their aspect is gloomy, but you can sense reverence that radiates from them like heat from a stove. One after another, they lower their heads and draw a half circle against their chests. Out of the corner of your eye, you see the assistant shrug and make a protective sign. <laughs> Heretics! May you scoundrels burn at a stake of the name of the angels! You! Keep your own... Uh, you! Keep your mouth shut until I tell you otherwise. You cut the old man short in mid-sentence. You jump up the horse, but take a look back as you approach the bridge. The butchers are standing still on the gates with their heads down. 
Well, now I've got a cult, I guess. <laughs> Science cult! Science cult! Alright, let's go. Oh, I can actually go to the Palace Square anyway. Well, it's on the way back home, I guess. The market turned on a wide street from Palace Square to the Temple Square. It does not only work on church holidays when the Royal Procession stands on the Angel Chapel in this way. Anything can be found here. Poor hawkers and prosperous shopkeepers from all over the country put their goods on counters from dawn to dusk. Some shops, like boxes with a double bottom, hide in, hide in themselves a completely different content than, than that for which the merchant receives money from the townspeople. Deprived of privilege, you are an uninvited guest here. Few people want to trade with the executioner and thus bring on their business fail. But you know exactly who you are looking for. Uh, what have I got? I've got cash, so let's have a look at the apothecary. The familiar oak sheathed room smells of sweat and also has the sharp smell of polish and apothecary powders, with which which were made right here on this broad and long counter in the morning. Small white moths dance in the broad shafts of daylight, coming from broad and bright windows. The owner watches the labour of one young apprentice, who writes the labels for vials. Seeing you, the apothecary shudders, sweats and angrily. Sweat and angry, but then gives himself a wry smile and motions you greetingly, wavering, the apprenti wavering, wavering at the apprentice to go inside the shop. Fucking hell. Right, so I've got... Let's get the spice... Should I buy some smack? I feel like smack is not a great idea right now. I'm assuming that's to help my sanity, that's to help my stamina, and this is to help my health. Bandage kit. Arnica ointment for injuries and metal power to stop the bleeding. <laughs> Excuse me. Put some alcohol on Charpy first, then an ointment, and press firmly to the wounds, covered with powder, master executioner. You do have Charpy, don't you? I do have, you answer gloomy. You better use an old leaky shirt as a bandage rather than buy here overpriced bands. Ah, thank you, Sol. Um, having a first aid kit's probably not a bad idea, just in case I get smacked about at a point where I can't actually heal myself, so... Rag and Bone Man. I'm only human after all. The smithy features the hole between the shingles of the roof. The barrel under rain, rain pipe or pipe. Rain, <laughs> The barrel under the rainwater pipe smells with rot. The doorstep is dark from rains and the door is skewed. There are smells of coal, sauerkraut and porridge coming from inside. And as lean and moody, Nell grimly hammers the horseshoe, held in the vice, you hear the faint moan of the red-hot iron. Rusty knives, axes and swords piled on the bench near the entrance attract your eyes with their fearsome shapes and the unbending glint of steel. Looks like they are lying for there for a long time. Nell bought them a scrap iron and cannot find a buyer unfussy enough to pay for them. Uh, right, what we got here? We've got some... Take some meat for free. I mean... Yeah, I'll take some of that. Ragmar smiles, smiles carnivorously. Master Executioner wishes for fresh meat. That's not the thing you see every day. I know the men from the slaughterhouse. Beef, tender and covered in thin veins of fresh fat, as your sense of smell tells you, will make the king-worthy dish when cooked in fire. You take the slab of meat from the counter suddenly, and the traitor twitches for a moment, but momentarily gives a touching smile, corrected. I could say that I supply the palace, couldn't I? <laughs> Extortion, motherfucker! Okay, let's have a look here. Good clothes for the executioner. It's not easy to find pants, jackets, and shirt of your size to replace frayed ones, but Ragman promises you everything that you need without a flinch. Not the carefully washed and darned rags taken from the dead, but clothes made by your measures. The one you're accustomed to made from the good materials, but simple. If Master Executioner wishes for new clothes, then it will be ready for him on the next day after the payment. He nods frequently with glinting eyes. I don't think we need to go like for a full glow up right now. Let's go to Nail. The smithy features the hole between the shingles and the roof. The barrel under rainbow. Uh, pff, sorry. Da -da 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 oh, this is all actually the same place, isn't it? Cleaver, act a new handle. Talk about. <laughs> Let's just chat shit. You come up next time later, mate, huh? Now I'll ask guiltily. I have here, you know. One window is tidying up. Oh, one window is tidying up. She's out of her mind seeing you. Women are superstitious like cats are hairy. He doesn't want you to be seen next to his forge, but he does not want to let you go as a buyer either. People, they do not think, who have something inside. So the blacksmith continues. To me too, they begin to look less often. After all, I cope alone without assistance. Give me only a time. That, I, that entire thing, word soup. Gotta look fancy. <laughs> It's like a fucking JoJo's Bizarre Adventure scene. Just fucking activate your stand and remove a man's head. You already know that both of his sons died in the war and do not say anything in response. While the blacksmith has time to work, you barely see a perceptible tremor in his hands. Another tear. 
too, and he will not keep pace. There always must be a good knife with broad blade at home, Nell says with hope. Like this one, for example. I will clean the rust and sharpen it so it will shine as good as new, and if some villain breaks into your house, then it will come in handy for other things than butchering animal carcasses. You nod silently. You have a butchered a carcass once in your life, but you know well that what can be done with such a cleaver against attackers. Nell doesn't think, as it seems, that you need a kitchenware, but blacksmith remains silent. The money is what he needs. Uh, 120. That's, that's more expensive than a good set of clothes, Jesus Christ. Are you the standard or the character you'll stand? Oh, that's a good fucking question. I mean, if this guy's my stand, not too fast. He seems pretty chill. Let's see, new handle. Okay, the handle's not too bad. Every weapon needs care. There is no difference between chopping heads or chopping oak in the grove. They, uh, I don't know why it goes. This guy has a strain, apparently. And family heirloom demands special care. There, you see, the axe handle is so worn that the butt will fall off soon. Now cast up. Uh, now cast hopeful a sidelong glance up at you and points on the wood blocks piled on the bench. I will strengthen the axe part and the new handle will come handy. But not your father. You're not your father, and he is not your grandfather. That means the axe must serve you, not them. You need a heavier weapon and one without the without the dents. While you're wavering, he adds, the size left by your father could be transferred to the new handle, if you wish. I think a new handle sounds about right. Wait, did I just get two new handles? Uh, two new axes? Okay. Once being notches like Father Dietrich, so we'll notch you with your finger familiarly. Two dozen notches, two dozen of Father's victims. And hand the axe back to Black. Can you mark line with initials? Oh, that's going to cost. That's that's a lot for custom. <laughs> Fucking just running around customizing my axe like a dickhead. Alright. I think that's us good. Let's just go home. <laughs> And catch some goddamn Zeds. Let's just see. New skills. I've still got 10 XP, actually. Basics of surgery. Hey! You can actually learn that now. Okay, let's have a look. What does that do? Okay, the main thing in surgery is constant practice. And thanks to the master of the slaughterhouse, you have it. Now you spend less effort to cut the heads off or limbs. It helps in battle as well as at work. In addition, you figured out how to use amputation in inter interrogation. Oh, so I can actually learn new types of torturing. Yay! Oh yeah, like it's it's trying to fit the rhythm and pace of something I totally appreciate. Right, let's learn that. Cruelty, god damn. You're fenced off from the world by your wall of indifference. It is difficult to touch you with the suffering of others, cruelty or something out of the ordinary, but bright feelings, able to comfort or inspire, also penetrate that wall with difficulty. See, I think like some of these, like the emotion emotive ones do have, like, double-edged sword effects. Like, stuff like that, I may actually find it harder to heal uh, sanity afterwards. So I think we may just leave it there. And they're cruelty. It's not even about height or executioner's axe behind your back. People and animals easily surrender to fear, feeling in you the most dangerous predator. I mean, I could learn cruelty just to scare the shit out of motherfuckers. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to be nice. I'm just going to look fucking terrifying. Level 2 Executioner's Axe. Fucking tasty. Right. Okay, can't use that as a quest item, but I can have some fresh meat in here. Nice! Okay, well, let us go to fucking bed. Catch some Zeds. Yeah, let's have some supper as well. Still, you need sleep. A few hours before dawn, when even the thieves and nightmen are going to bed, you rest you, rest so you can start the day with the first rays of sun. Nom 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 nom. There we go. Act cruel ass needed. <laughs> Absolutely. Nice, there we go. You get up at sunrise. Your hands habitually open the shutters. Draw a bucket of water from the well. Make up fire in the hearth. Grease the frying pan. These simple actions do not require conscious awareness and you lose yourself in musings over your nightmares. Only having taken a seat at the table, you realise that you have prepared breakfast for two. You'll need strength today, but you have no appetite. A distant sound of hasty footsteps distracts you from the thoughts of your father. This is the clatter of your assistant's wooden shoes. You stand up to unlock the gates and cast a glance at the plates. Eh, I'm not eating it. Help yourself, man. You open the gates just as the assistant shows up around the corner. The old man seems to have had no sleep this night, and this makes his countenance even more sour than usual. Any news? You ask, returning to the porch. 
The judge has sent a note to the prison. Summons you on a private matter. The assistant follows you into the house. Uh, will you visit him? Even if you decide to talk to the judge, this is none of your assistant's business. Uh, maybe. You turn around to look at him as he hastily averts his covetous gaze from the remains of your breakfast. The old man always seems to be hungry. Apparently, recent events have had no impact on his appetite. Uh, let me take the food from the table. <laughs> you may take your food from the table. You wave your hand without looking. You are certain that you have interpreted the assistant's look right. He is very hungry and barely restrains himself from attacking your victuals at once. Yet instead of gratitude, the old man suddenly starts wailing. They treat me like trash, them bastards! They pay me a pittance! They say I eat scraps! That I catch rats for dinner! That I ain't above human flesh! But I'll earn them! Damn them! Yes, master! Damn them! He spits out. <laughs> you don't feel like you're listening to the angry cries of a crazy old coot. <laughs> Eat! The old man hates the entire world so bitterly that he can't even play nice even for his own benefit. He do not relish the prospect of doing your grisly work single-handedly, which means you have to make sure your assistant doesn't die of hunger. Grabbing him by the neck and making him choke on his oath, you drag the old man to his table and tumble him onto the bench. Sit down and eat. Quietly. Or shall I force the meal into your mouth? You'll wait another bout of wailing and get ready to carry out your threat, but the assistant, smelling about, grabs a slice of bread with his bony fingers and starts to devour it ravenously. You turn away, pick up your father's diary and flip through the pages. At last, the loud chewing behind you ceases. Now, if that's all, get out. There are things to attend. The assistant sniffs in contempt and vanishes, but you still hear him moan and swear outside, cursing his fate and your stupidity. <laughs> what a fucking wanker! Jesus! As soon as, you hear, as soon as you hear outside your window a couple of thuds, like stones hitting your fence by the garbage pit, and a squeak cut short. Does the old man hunt rats? Seems like he's really got nothing to eat. Bandage your hand and you. Engrossed in thoughts and hypnotised by the gurge of water in the cauldron, you pay no attention to the creaking of the gates and light footsteps, so a tap on the door makes you start. The maid appears at the door. The door opens and a lean figure presents itself against the background of the morning sky. Bright gown, silky hair, gentle neck. When you were a boy, you often pictured your mother. Your father only told you that she was beautiful and that she died giving birth to you. In your whole life, you have never known a woman's touch. Yet you often imagined that your, mother were that your mother were alive and in times of hardship, you felt her gentle hands embrace you, pat your head, and made this world, and this made the world feel a little brighter. Yet in your dreams, you could never see her face, only a vague silhouette and the warmness she brought with her. Now you experience something similar, but brighter and more acute. You sense the smell of herbs, milk, and brittle wool. You notice a stray earlock playing in the wind, and pale freckles revealed by the sunlight and the tender skin of her face and forearms. You shake off the thought of your thoughts that, feeling her gaze prickle you, the maid watches you with apprehension, even hostility. A brave one you are. Townsfolk are afraid of even passing nearby. I am here on business, the maid jerks up a little around chin. I have nothing to fear now. Uh, come in. You step back from the door. A bittersweet smell of her hair tickles her nostrils when she slides inside. With her manners and her huge, frightened eyes, she reminds you of either a fawn or a forest spirit from a fable. A delicate and innocent creature, wary and ready to dash away at any moment. The maid looks around the room gingerly and visibly relaxes her slender shoulders. Perhaps she expected to see torture devices, human body parts, and other horrors that local boys describe to each other in spooky stories, claiming they have managed to get close enough and see everything with their own eyes. In an instant, you remember that there is a bowl of water on the table, left after a morning wo change of wound dressing. <laughs> oh, that's so fucking awkward, I love it. The maid doesn't notice the bowl of water and the cloth you have used to wipe your blood, but when you fold your arms across your chest, she spots the bandage. What's happened to your hand? Uh, it's nothing. You hide your hand behind your back before you check yourself. And then wreck yourself. You need a doctor to know it for sure, the maid says quietly. She hesitates, not confident enough to continue, then looks up at you earnestly. I know where Datura grows. It uses pain and cleans woods. Shall I collect some for you? You've read about this herb in your father's medical treatise. It's indeed used sometimes for the amelioration of pain, and the pagans used to call it the Sheol's Flower held it sacred and used it to breathe poisons, causing violent convulsions. Does the gamekeeper's daughter know about it? Does she want to poison you? This seems more likely than a sudden manifestation of mercy for the executioner who has cut short her father's life. 
Uh, that seems a bit hostile. Why do you think I would like to help you? She pauses for an answer. Dad's execution was the worst thing that has ever happened to me. But I believe that everyone has a chance of redemption. I have come to you because you have an opportunity to atone for the evil you have brought upon my family by doing the right thing. You see the maid's desperate eyes and recognise the fire burning in them. This is the consumptive desire of someone whose life has suddenly lost its meaning to get this meaning back. To do something significant. Something proper. Something inside you, something tormented and maimed in the last day's events, responds to this thought like a green sprout before a long-awaited rain. And what do you want from me? What was your quarrel with your father? Suddenly there is a bright, unhealthy flush of colour on her cheeks. Before the maid averts her gaze, you recognise the expression in her eyes. Pain. The gamekeeper's daughter is silent, and you understand that the answer, whether true or false, is going to cost her dearly. I'm not going to be an arsehole here. The maid frowns, then looks up at you with an effort. You are accustomed to hatred in other people's eyes, but this time, strangely enough, it is not directed at you. There was a lad who I fancied much. Dad learned about us not so long ago. He was very angry, and feared for me, I understand. She takes a shuddering sigh, and proceeds in a firm, almost level voice. We had a terrible quarrel then, and I ran to the city for Grandma, but returned later. I, since then, haven't seen that lad. You nod, accepting her answer. That's fair enough. Her words are filled with pain, like a well, a deep well of black, non-transparent water. She does not want to talk, but she is not lying. And what do you want from me? Yesterday you hanged my father for the crime he didn't commit. The maid hesitates. Well, true, sometimes he's abused his office in order to feed us in especially hard times, but he was no fool. You mean to say that he didn't kill that deer on the day of the Duke's hunt? You ask, somewhat confused. After all, the gamekeeper was a poacher, this you know for sure. He confessed to you himself. Father knew which route the hunting party was going to take, and he was very, very cautious. He could not leave a fresh bloody trail leading right to our doorstep. Someone just wanted the Duke's men to apprehend him. She wholeheartedly believes in what she says, and you must admit, her words sound reasonable. Yeah, I've, as your... <laughs> Spread X to doubt. You're full of shit and I'm going to kick you in the tits! No, nope, no, nope, sorry, that was wrong. Has your father told you the name of the name of the real culprit? The maid shakes her head. Dad never told me anything of the sort. He is... was very cautious. He didn't mix much with strangers. In winter, Dad's younger brother comes to visit us from the north, and they hunt together. He is a farmhand at a large estate, but in winter people hunger there and Dad helps him. Uncle is not much of a hunter. She goes silent, pulls nervously at the ends of her shawl. Having gathered her wit, she proceeds. But I know the forest well, and Dad taught me to read tracks. Several days have passed, and there has never been no rain. Perhaps the real criminal left his footprints there, or around the house. She falls quiet. Do you want me to go with you? You ask incredulously. She nods, her big eyes glistening with hope. The weirdest thing about it is that you would like to live up to her expectations. The gamekeeper was a criminal, but your guts told you that something in the story was wrong, and now you have a real chance to learn what exactly. So you hope to find some clue and track the one who framed your father. The idea brightens the inside of your head like a sunburst. You wait for another nod and ask her straight. Afraid to go alone? The maid looks at you angrily, then answers slowly. I fear that the new gamekeeper will drive me away. You might help. This is not all. She seems to tune into the sorrow and loneliness inside and fear of her memories of home, rather than her own safety. Fair enough. Yeah, this... She sounds chill. She sounds chill. And I get to go into CSI fucking Prague, apparently. Fine, let's go and take a look at these tracks of yours, you declare, feeling the warmth of the decision firmly makes spread throughout your body. If we set off now... Oh, if we set off now, we'll get there even before midday. The new owner might not even be there to meet us. He has to check the trails in the morning. The maid says hastily. She doesn't look too happy about your consent, but evidently fears that you might change your mind. On the verge of crossing the threshold, she stops, rooted on the spot. And what 
are you going to do with my dad's body? Um, I live a trade on corpses. It's a valuable commodity and there are always many willing to purchase. The maid proudly shrugs her shoulders. I have no money, but perhaps you would agree to take Grandma's hut as payment. This is the only thing left to us. You look around you, noticing how the ceiling is dark with age. I already have a house. I only need money to live. The maid answers through gritted teeth. There's nothing else I have. I, I, I can't give you the body. <laughs> I have removed... It is in several places at this point. One of which is inside the dog. Do you want the dog? The dog contains as much of the, as your dad as I can possibly give you at this point. <laughs> Plus he seems to be kind of adorable, if a bit pussy. Your father would hardly have approved of this, you say. His last words are about you. He was anxious about your prospects. You stop when you notice her sobbing, but she turns away abruptly. Do you want me to sell the body to you? A bitter sigh and a furious jerk of her chin show that the maid barely fights the urge to burst into tears. She is standing with her back to you, clutching the doorknob too tight. What if you catch the real criminal? You will get paid for his execution as well. Maybe then you will let me, let me take my dad and give him a proper burial? Unfortunately, your dad will live off in the dog or something. Yes! I've already sold the body. The maid smiles sadly. Don't worry. I anticipated the answer, but I had to try. A rim of light around her silhouette pales. Yeah, I've been streaming for just a little bit under two hours, and I think I want to call it there. That feels like a really nice moment to call it. So, um, thank you very much for attending the soul, for attending the soul stream. No, for attending the stream, soul. Um, but I have to get ready to go out in about an hour, so ugh, I need to make myself partially decent. But yeah, man, this is such an interesting story, and it's it's going in places I really did not anticipate. So yeah, um, thank you very much for. Uh, chilling out with me and in, in, in experiencing some weird bullshit and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll catch you fucking later I guess. Peace.